What is going on guys, my name is John, and welcome back to yet another video. Among all the side series Pokemon games, the stadium based Pokemon series attracted fans who wanted both the handheld and console experience of battling their favorite monsters. Although you could use your own Pokemon, what if that wasn't an option? Today we're going to find out how easily you can beat Pokemon Battle Revolution with only rental Pokemon. Now if you haven't played Pokemon Battle Revolution before, let me just give a quick rundown of what this game is all about. Pokemon Battle Revolution was released in the United States on June 7, 2007, and this was a series long away to return to the side series Battle Only Pokemon games. Although you could partially argue that it's only been like two years because of XD and games like Pokemon Coliseum, realistically Pokemon Stadium 2 was the last iteration of the series. Although the big appeal that these games had was the fact that you could play Pokemon in 3D, probably the most exciting feature is you could connect your own mainline games and take on the battles with whatever Pokemon you wanted. This is personally why I picked up my copy back when it came out, but let's look at it from a different angle. What if you never had any of the mainline games? Is it actually possible to beat the games with only the small selection of rental teams that are available? Before we get into all this, be sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe for more content like this. And with that out of the way, let's just jump right into it. So when we first start the game, we're instructed with creating our own profile before arriving in Poketopia. And then we meet Anna, who is presumably the only person who works in this entire city. After going through some of the initial information, we're presented with a battle pass, and we can choose one of these two rental passes to use on our journey. At first glance, both of these passes seem pretty standard, and they're nearly identical in terms of type coverage, but in my opinion one of these is much more optimal than the other. If we take a look at Novice Nate's rental pass, it contains all of the Sinnoh starters, Luxio, Gabite, and Staravia. Although its type coverage is really good, the most notable issue that I've found with this team is the fact that the only hold item that they all use are the elemental plates, but they boost their countering moves rather than their stab moves. In this type of challenge, I feel like you should be trying to deal as much damage as you can, and while this definitely evens out all the coverage on your team, I think that this team would be significantly better if it had all the items that the other rental team has. Another potential issue with this team is that Luxio has the ability Rivalry. This increases the power of its moves if the opponent is of the same gender, and it decreases it if it's the opposite. This can definitely be pretty helpful, but this can also obviously put you in a bad position, especially if you're down to your last few Pokemon. Cindy's team consists of Gen 1 Pokemon rather than Gen 4, and like I mentioned earlier, it's basically the same team. We have the Kanto starters, Dragonair, Rhyhorn, and Pidgeot. The starters in Rhyhorn each get their respective stab boosting item, while Dragonair gets the Citrus Berry for extra bulk, and Pidgeot gets the Muscle Band to boost his physical moves. Admittedly, the type coverage is a bit weaker in this set, but small things like having Pidgeot over Staravia, Rhyhorn's Lightning Rod, and a strong mix of status moves really won me over after looking over my options. I like to know that this choice isn't permanent, and you can swap between the two of them at any time. Now that we have our team selected, we can get a greater view of Poketopia and see all the different Coliseums that we can take on. The story mode for this game is very similar to the Battle Frontiers in almost every other Pokemon game, as they vary in style and difficulty, so in most cases you'll have to adapt to a specific additional rule in order to do well in the battles. Although we currently have the choice of two locations, the first one that we're going to take on is the Gateway Coliseum. This is intended to be the introductory area, and this is the only Coliseum that requires you to use a rental team to compete. Just like the Battle Tower, you're required to face off against 7 trainers per set, with the final trainer being somewhat of a gym leader to truly test your skills. I'd like to note that because there are a ton of battles that you have to take on in this entire game, I'm not going to talk about each and every match. Instead, I'm just going to talk about the notable ones in each set, so if you'd like to do this yourself, you can learn from my really poor battling skills. Because this is supposed to be the beginner's area for getting the hang of battling, the battles are unsurprisingly very straightforward. A majority of the Pokemon you face are either normal or bug types, which I'm pretty sure was intentional to match the encounters that you regularly see in the first few rounds of the mainline games. The format for this Coliseum starts out with only single battles, which means that you can only pick 3 members out of your team. But because the type pool is pretty limited here, you're probably going to pick nearly the exact same team every single match. If you ever played any of the Battle Frontiers or variants over the years, these teams are similar to what you'd see in the first 20 or so matches. Only a couple of the Pokemon here are fully evolved, and their movesets are pretty bare bones with only a few genuinely good stab options. Even if you have limited battle experience, it shouldn't take you more than 2 tries to beat this, and I feel pretty generous saying that. When it came to the battles, the first 6 were extremely easy to run through, as Charmeleon carried with its ability to boost Fire Fang with Sunny Day. I did have a bit of trouble with Battle 5 with a Vibrava that kept using Sand Attack, but as you'd expect, this requires a very small amount of attention. 
After completing the first six, we have to take on the Colosseum Master for this area. Joe. Not the most intimidating name, is it? Now, in comparison to the other battles, this one was a lot more fun to take on because both teams counter each other pretty well. Each of the Pokemon on his team have stab moves that are stronger than most of the moves our team has access to, and this is the first time that you have to battle against a trainer that has held items other than regular berries. Although statistically my team is better than his, I brought two Pokemon that were weak to rock type moves, which made taking down Torchic's Rock Slide much more difficult, but thankfully Dragonair was bulky enough to remove it from the field. After that, the battle was significantly easier, and I was able to get through this entire Coliseum without losing a single Pokemon. Let's check out the next one. Main Street Coliseum is the second area that you can access right at the beginning of the game, and although you can still use rental teams, I believe that they made this one to incentivize importing your own Pokemon to take this one on. Aside from the visuals, the rules are exactly the same as the previous area, but you can tell right away that the teams are not only more diverse, but the movesets are a lot more threatening than Gateway. Once again, there were only a few hiccups along the way, most notable Celio stalling out my entire team with Attract, but once again, if you're competent with type matchups, you should do just fine. The final battle against Taylor, however, was a little rough. At first glance, you're probably thinking, this team sucks, how could you have any problems with it? And while that's completely validated, it really came down to the status problems. From the get-go, I had a great advantage with Rhyhorn over Luxio, but because it outsped me, it was able to get a swagger off while I tried to use Dig. I ended up hitting myself twice, which allowed Luxio to get off two Ice Fangs. I decided to send out Dragonair because it could deal the most damage out of my team, but Luxio paralyzed me first turn with Spark, and then used Swagger until it could take me down. The last Pokemon I had on my team was Ivysaur, and considering that it's weak to Ice Fang, I assumed that it was all over. I went for Magical Leaf and ended up beating the Speed Tie to knock it out. The last two Pokemon were Love Disk and Pachirisu, which was nearly the best case scenario, but I still had a strong potential to lose at any point. Thankfully, Ivysaur had Leech Seed and Toxic, so I was able to stall the battle long enough to secure the win. After completing the first two areas, we can unlock the Waterfall Coliseum, which is the start of our Battle Frontier style locations. Once again, we're playing in the single battle format, but there is one element that completely changes your playstyle. In this Coliseum, you pick five Pokemon from your team, and each Pokemon face off in a one versus one battle against one of your opponent's Pokemon. Each battle is completely separate from one another, which means that you're unable to switch at any point, and you have to do your best to overcome the type advantage or disadvantage. Because you pick five Pokemon, this is a best of three set for each trainer, so it's up to you to lead with the three best Pokemon that you have, or evenly spread them out throughout the set to ensure your victory. A majority of the teams that you face here focus on one or two types, so it's usually very obvious which Pokemon you shouldn't bring. But because you have to select all but one, there are plenty of times where you have to bring a bad matchup just because you don't have any other choice. Personally, I thought that this one was going to be a pretty tough Coliseum to get through, but because the Pokemon you face aren't exactly the most fierce opponents that you'll ever see, even some bad matchups were possible because of the rental team's base stats are pretty solid. Coliseum Leader Marina is the final trainer that you fight in this area, and her team is by far the most lackluster team in the game. I genuinely thought something was wrong with my copy of the game because there was nothing notable on her team, but for some reason they decided to make her team extremely weak to grass and electric types. And I get that this is supposed to be the water area for the game, but she could have at least had a starter or something to make it even slightly difficult. Obviously I'm not complaining about being able to continue my challenge, but you get what I'm saying. Upon completing this, we can now access the Neon and Crystal Coliseums. The Neon Coliseum is by far the most unique one in my opinion, as you really have to pay attention to the decisions that you make. Before the battle starts, all 12 Pokemon from both teams are placed on essentially a roulette table called the Pokemon Wheel. Each player takes a turn pointing the Wii Remote at the screen and selecting a Pokemon as the wheel spins. As a result, you have a chance of getting a mix of both your Pokemon as well as your opponents, which adds a lot of strategy of trying to pick the best Pokemon on the wheel, but also finding the best counters to your opponent. This is also the first Coliseum that is set to double battles, which arguably makes things much easier if you end up selecting a really bad Pokemon from the roulette. This sounds like it'd be a shot in the dark every match, but I learned very quickly that all of these matches can be very easily exploited. I found out in the third round that since the wheel constantly spins at the same speed, if you calculate how far the wheel rotates from the time that you press the A button to when it lands on a Pokemon, you can consistently pick out exactly which Pokemon you want for the battle. I found out that it moves about 7 spaces, so if you put your cursor around the 4 o'clock position and press it when your Pokemon is in the 9 o'clock position, you'll get that Pokemon nearly every single time. The only risk with this is that if you land on a Pokemon that's already been taken, you'll be given a completely random Pokemon instead. 
With this in mind, this set was extremely easy when I was able to pick out the counters I needed, but there was one battle that definitely didn't go the way that I wanted. I didn't aim my Wii Remote in the right spot on the 6th battle, so I ended up with 2 Charmeleon on my team, and because my opponent had a War Turtle, Pidgeot, and my Ivysaur, I was completely overpowered and ended up losing my first battle in the entire challenge. Fortunately, I had to continue so it didn't really matter, but I'm thankful that I figured out how to take advantage of the roulette because I'm sure lots of battles could have been like this. Crystal Coliseum is the next area in our journey, and this one takes heavy inspiration from Pokemon Emerald. In this Coliseum, you have to face off in a 16 player double battle bracket, and the objective is to obviously win the tournament in order to face a leader. If you watched the video I did last year on all the Battle Frontier medals, this is almost exactly like the Battle Dome but there are a few small differences that make it not seem like a complete copy and paste. Unlike the Gen 3 mode, the leader isn't in the bracket, as they're the final test after you prove your worth by winning the tournament first. Because there are only 16 opponents, in total you have to only face 5 trainers in the entire Coliseum, rather than the 7 like everywhere else. Aside from the first battle, the bracket results are random, so if you end up losing, odds are the second time around you'll be facing completely different trainers. When it came time to take on leader Voldon, this is probably the first battle where you have some genuinely strong Pokemon to face up against. Machoke, Metang, and Rotom can easily run through our team, and when you combine that with the fact that it's a double battle, it only takes a couple turns to get set up and completely destroyed. Thankfully Voldon led with the two worst leads you could possibly have, Rotom and Elekid. Because I lead with Rhyhorn, all the electric attacks went to him because of Lightning Rod. The AI doesn't count for this ability, so in total his team was able to get off a single damaging move against my entire team. After completing the Neon and Crystal rounds, we're able to go to Sunny Park Coliseum. This is probably the least eventful one, as it's only a double battle set, but this is one of the few that changes after you complete the game. On the second run through, it turns into the Little Cup, but we'll talk more about the round 2 variants once we've finished up the main story. There really isn't a ton to talk about for this one, as it's basically just Main Street Coliseum with two more Pokemon on the field. In total I had about two Pokemon knockout through all seven battles, so let's just move on to the next area. Magma Coliseum is up next, and this one can be easily compared to the Crystal Coliseum, as it's another tournament style competition, but this Coliseum isn't entirely about winning your matches. The game starts out with a chart that shows off all the trainers in the competition, and the objective is to have the highest score out of every trainer in order to be able to face a leader. Your score is calculated by how many Pokemon you have remaining by the end of the battle, which means that you can lose this Coliseum multiple times and still have a small chance to come in first. We're once again competing in the single battle format, which definitely makes this a lot more difficult, especially considering that your opponent's teams are much more diverse than all the others. The first couple of battles weren't really that difficult to get through, but number 3 was a pretty embarrassing fight. After taking down his Lopunny, he sent out Graveler and went for Rock Polish. Because I lost Ivysaur right before he sent him out, I had no counter to it, so he used Rollout and then ran through the rest of my team. Thankfully this didn't matter at the end because I won the tournament by 5 points, but if you're following along, just keep an eye out for that. Coliseum leader Terrell is basically a better version of Joe from Gateway, as his team consists almost entirely of starters. Although he has a heavy fire weakness, it compensates for that by having a bunch of extremely strong stab moves like Surf, Earthquake, Flamethrower, and Grass Knot. Oddly enough, Ivysaur was the MVP for this match, as it needed to clutch out the battle versus Printplop. Because it was holding a Citrus Berry, I needed it to tank an Ice Beam, and because I put it low enough to activate Overgrow, I was able to get the upper hand. This is easily the most difficult battle by far, but I managed to get through it with only losing one Pokemon. Sunset Coliseum is not only my favorite looking Coliseum, but it's also one of the most difficult ones. Instead of using rental teams, we're forced to use rental Pokemon. The entirety of these battles is almost randomly selected Pokemon, which means you have to learn your team on the spot, as both sides will be completely replaced with the next match. The movesets for these Pokemon are generally average at best, but it's really important to check them before the battle so you don't make a poor decision. From what I looked up online, 6 of the 12 potential Pokemon are static in each match but these are also slightly random in that they can be available on either team. As a result, a lot of these battles took a lot of thinking, especially in moments when you have zero counters to a lot of the Pokemon on your opponent's team. Because these can tend to be unfair, you only have to complete a total of 4 battles, which is definitely relieving, but that doesn't change the fact that this probably took the longest out of any of the Colosseums so far. The most notable battle was number 2, where my opponent had both Gabite and Dragonair. Because they had access to Dragon Rage, they dealt so much damage per turn that I was swept and had to start all over. 
Thankfully on the second time around, I got both instead, so I just stole their idea and won that without a problem. Coliseum leader Dusty was another tough opponent because of the potential Pokemon it can have, but thankfully I had a really strong lead on turn 1, which made it possible to just barely scrape by for the final victory. I will say that Vigoroth is by far the most difficult Pokemon to take down, so if he ends up bringing that one, I suggest taking that down first. Now that we've completed that section, we only have two areas left to take on, Courtyard and Stargazer Coliseum. Courtyard Coliseum is essentially the same as Sunny Park, with the only difference being the post-game mode, so there once again isn't too much to talk about. I will say though that the final battle with Master Kruger was almost a disaster because of his Hitmontop. With the combination of Triple Kick and Mach Punch, it was able to knock out three of my Pokemon, but thankfully Rhydon of all Pokemon was able to finish it off. Stargazer Coliseum is the final area in the main story of Battle Revolution, and in a weird way it's very similar as to how Sword and Shield manages their tournament at the end of the game. The first six opponents that you face here are the Coliseum leaders from each area, and if you had no problem defeating them before, this should be a relatively easy section. For some reason they decide to not give them new movesets, instead you fight the same team in double battle format. Now this is enough of a change for a lot of people to not notice, but I was pretty surprised that they didn't even make them just a little bit more difficult to take on. That being said, this format does allow some Pokemon to shine brighter now, with a great example being Carnivine, who goes from Happy Plant to Terrifying Demon after using two sword stances. The rest of the battles have roughly the same complaints as before, with Pokemon like Prinplop and Luxio but the 6th battle against Dusty was much more difficult for some reason. Vigoroth and Gabite are such a dangerous combination that it's difficult to pick which Pokemon you should take out first. Body Slam deals insane damage because of Stab, and Gabite's access to Dig gives you only a few chances to hurt it before you run out of Pokemon. I ended up losing twice and had to start from scratch, so personally this is the hardest one out of the first 6. But once you defeat him, you're ready to take on the Poketopia Master. Mysterial is the final boss for this game, and just like every other character in this game, there is no story behind this at all. I have no idea if this is a bad guy or a good guy. I mean, he looks like a bad guy, but either way, this is our final test in completing the entire challenge. In comparison to every other battle we've looked at so far, this team is significantly stronger for so many reasons. Every Pokemon has high stats with a good hold item, and every move that they know is ridiculously strong and makes sense for the Pokemon that it's applied to. Although they're all great, Haunter, Chansey, and Dragonair are the big troubles for this battle, as they do great jobs of fitting the sweeper, wall, and setup roles to box you in at all angles. Personally, this is how I envisioned every other leader's battle was going to be, but this is by far the most difficult battle in the entire main story by a long shot. On my first run through, he led with Golbat and Haunter, and I assumed that Haunter was a much greater issue, but because of its speed, it was able to quickly take out a majority of my team. I didn't have any continues, so I had to start all over again but it only took me about 45 minutes to get back to Mysterial. In the second battle, he led with Kingler and Chansey, which is much easier to work with, but the game really wanted to compensate for all the easy battles earlier, and turn this match into the world record for the most status and item uses in a 5 minute battle. Kingler's Quick Claw popped 3 times in a row, which if you were wondering, that's a 1 in 125 chance. Chansey not only landed every thunder that it went for, but it paralyzed 3 of my Pokemon because of Serene Grace. From turn 1 I knew this battle was completely over, but thankfully I earned one continue so I didn't have to crawl my way to the top all over again. This time he led with Kingler and Chansey again, and although I knew statistically it wouldn't happen again, I specifically targeted Kingler out of pettiness just so there wouldn't even be a chance. Chansey was by far the hardest Pokemon to take down, but I think that I made the best play by using Leech Seed on it with Ivysaur. Because it's based on HP, Ivysaur was gaining a ridiculous amount after each turn, which helped it stay on the field for a majority of the battle. Once I was able to take that and Dragonair out, Golbat was the only Pokemon left in a 2v1. After finishing it off with a Shockwave, we've successfully defeated Mysterial, as well as defeated the entire game with only rental Pokemon. But there's still a couple more things that I want to take a look at. After I finished recording the last battle, part of me felt like this challenge was way too easy, which took me by surprise because in concept I assumed this should have been much more difficult. As I mentioned earlier, once you defeat the Stargazer Coliseum, a few of the parks change to different modes to add a little bit more content to the game. This includes stuff like the Little Cup and a 100 Trainer Challenge, but the most notable addition are the Masters Battles at the Stargazer Coliseum. This event consists of 8 sets of 4 battles, with the 4th match being against one of the previous Coliseum leaders. After doing a bit of research, I figured it would be interesting to see just how far I can make it in the post game, so I started out with my original team on the first set and… Yeah. 
There isn't a single chance. One thing that a bunch of you might have been mentioning is the fact that I can technically create my own rental team. Throughout the process of beating the game, you unlock new rental teams that can be used if you use them to defeat the Gateway Coliseum. If you go to manage your rental passes, you can actually move the Pokemon around to each pass and make your own team with the very limited selection that's available. After spending time unlocking a bunch of teams, I spent a bunch of time trying to experiment with a team that could take it on, but I slowly started to realize that this was a losing battle. Despite the first battle being pretty easy, the second and third battles are so difficult to get through and it only took me about 15 run-throughs to understand why. In the third match, the opponent's Mr. Mime outsped my Dugtrio, which I initially thought was very peculiar. So I looked up its moveset and the only thing that it was holding was an Expert Belt. Considering that Dugtrio's base speed is 30 points higher than Mr. Mime, it's pretty safe to say that all of these Pokemon are EV trained with potentially good IVs. If you look at the stats of the rental Pokemon, you can compare it with a damage calculator and see that they're definitely not EV trained, which makes these battles nearly impossible to complete without having Pokemon from an outside game. Regardless, I still gave it an honest effort and tried to see just how far I could possibly go. After about 30 attempts with a large variety of different teams, I managed to get to the final battle twice. Now I'm not going to act like a professional at competitive battling, because personally I think that's my weakest Pokemon skill, but the cards aren't exactly in your favor in any of these battles. In about 60-ish percent of my attempts, I lost in the second battle, with the other 15% being the third battle. The first match is actually pretty easy because they're all starter bug types, but any battle after that is just too tough to consistently beat. You're stuck in between dealing too little damage and not having strong enough moves to get anywhere. The final attempt I had against Joe started out pretty well, to the point where I had a pretty solid advantage. But when I tried to use Magnitude with Dugtrio, I ended up rolling the weakest Magnitude, which is about a 5% chance. And because I was also holding the King's Rock, I flinched only my Mighty Enna to then be completely drowned by Empoleon to lose the game. Which is probably the game telling me that I don't stand a chance. Considering that the 8th set consists of Legendaries and Mythicals, I'm very confident that I wouldn't win that anyways. But on the upside, I was still able to complete the challenge I set out from the beginning. But how did I do? So let's review. In total, it took me about 8 hours to beat every Colosseum, with a majority of that consisting of having to fight my way back to Ms. Serial, only to be knocked down again. Overall, this wasn't really too difficult of a challenge, which I kinda still feel bad for, but I will say that there are other games where I can attempt this. Pokemon Stadium 2 would be a much, much more challenging task, but that video would take a pretty crazy amount of time to complete. If this video hit something like, I don't know, 20,000 likes, I'd go for it, but that would definitely be one of the hardest challenges I've ever had to take on. If that's something crazy that you'd like to see, be sure to show your support in the comments down below. Aside from that, that's all there is to say about beating Pokemon Battle Revolution with only rental Pokemon. And that's gonna do it for today's video. If you liked the video, leave a like and consider subscribing, as I'll be making more content like this very soon. If you have any other suggestions for videos that you'd like to see, leave a comment below. Follow me on Twitter to keep updated with new videos as they come out. Other than that, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.